How many of you? How many of you watched Friday's uh, devotion? I made my wife. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I got it. I don't think I got it. Sent to me because I usually try to, but I don't think I got it. Maybe it was just Tina. But I want to do it, try to do it anyway. If you were, um, if you were giving God a uh, one to five rating, one being poor performance, five being uh, exemplary performance, how many stars would you give him? That's what the, that's what the devotional was about. How many stars would you give? I gave him three. And all of you saying, let's move back a little bit. <laughs> now, if you see the devotional, uh, you will uh, you'll understand that better. Uh, but what would you give him? <laughs> I could. <laughs> What's that? Probably a three. He controlled this world a lot more. <laughs> and, and those were some of the comments that I made. Yeah. After the year I had, I, I mean, I can't help but give him a five because he's been there in ways unimaginable. Sorry, I just, I know that's not probably what you're getting at, but no, I, I just, I'm not getting at anything other than <laughs> wanting to hear, you know, an honest answer. And, you know, this world is this world, but um, he's still God and sovereign, and I just, I don't know. As we're going to find out today, or you touch his own soul, or you put touch his own Good question. We're going to talk about that, too. Or, or yeah, I refer back to, to Job some too. I have to give him a five because like who am I to say <laughs> what you should have done, what you should not have done. You're in chapter 42. <laughs> you go back to chapters three through sure. about 31. Sure. Uh, well, I'm, I'm not sure Job's given him a five. Okay. I agree. But God put him back in his place too. <laughs> Here's part of what I, I want to point I want to make as we move into the lesson about the, the ten spies. We have become a culture now that loves to rate, give reviews, and rank. You know, the restaurant experience, the hotel experience. <coughs> you can even go on Facebook and rank Greenwald. Okay? You, you can do that too. Five would be preferable. Okay. <laughs> Um, but the problem with that is it creates a consumer mindset even for followers of Jesus. As Joe found out and Matt pointed it out, who in the world are we to make some kind of evaluation and rating of God? Who do we think we are? And yet what we're going to see today in the ten spies, is guys who thought they knew a little bit better than God. So let's jump in to the lesson um, with question number one. The Apostle Paul wrote, We live by uh, faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7. In life, we may be prodded by God to leave what is familiar and comfortable in order to use our God-given gifts more fully to his glory. In those moments, we may experience a crisis of faith caused by fear. You ever had those moments? I'd be surprised if you haven't had something like that. What does it mean to live by faith? I mean, Paul says it very boldly. We live by faith. We don't live by sight. What does it mean to live by faith? I don't think it means to live without fear. So what do I do with fear then? Oh. 
I mean, for me, I think living by faith is accepting the attitude of uh, I don't know the answers and I'm okay with that. Okay, so there's a humility that acknowledges I don't know all the answers, but I know the one who does. And I'm, I'm content for him to know. There is a plan. I didn't make the plan, but I work in the plan. Okay? Someone else, what does it mean to live by faith? I just think about like no matter what's happening to us or around us, um, things aren't always going to be perfect, but God is still going to be victorious in the end. And I have faith in that. All right. So I believe in the end of the story that God's will will prevail. Maybe in spite of fear. Maybe in spite of fear. See, I think that this is, you know, we, we use that phrase commonly. We talk about living by faith. I think that living by faith means that we follow God wherever he is leading, even when we can't see it, even when we don't understand it, even when we feel inadequate or unprepared for it. It's trusting and obeying. That's what faith is. Okay. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen me uh, talk about this in some time, uh, faith equals trust plus obey. Okay? That's what faith is. And it is not conditional on me understanding things. It's not conditional on me uh, controlling things. Uh, it's I accept God being in control. Here's what happens that's often produced by fear. People panic. They get in moments in their lives when life is stressful or pressure-filled, and they panic. And what they do in the midst of that is they start looking around for what seems to be working for other people. They don't trust and obey God in those moments. They start looking around, what do I need to do that will make my life work the way it's working for whoever they think life is working for. That's not faith. That's sight. Okay? And that's the danger that happens, especially when we get a little bit nervous. Too often, we want to see and control. And that's not faith. All right? So let's read about Israel and the ten spies. Go to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. Somebody read verses 7 through 9. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them, to bring them up out of that land in a good and spacious land. A land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites have reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. Okay. God heard and responded to the Israelite cries. What <clears throat> promises did God make in this passage to them? Deliverance. All right. He makes the promise of deliverance. I don't want to come back to that, but there's an implied promise that's not expressly stated just, just by reading what we've read. What's, what's the implied promise? I know I'm getting very vague, trying not to give the answer by. Well, he hears them and he cares, right? All right, say so yours one more time. All right, there will be deliverance, and we're going to talk about the deliverance. But say your, what you said, Matt. He hears them and he cares. Okay. God implied a promise to them when he heard them and he cared about them, which was the promise, I hear you and I care about you when you call to me. Okay? That's one of the implied promises um, that's not 
expressly stated here, but the fact that he heard them and he responded to them tells you that's the kind of God we have. All right? He hears and he cares. All right, deliverance. What was the deliverance from and what was it to? Deliverance from Egypt into the promised land where everything is good, but I think one thing that frequently overlooks is the fact that that's currently somebody else's home. Occupied. Yeah. So what was going on in Egypt that they wanted to get delivered from? Slavery. Right, There's slaves in Egypt. There were no days off. Okay, that's what made the Sabbath command in Exodus 20 so meaningful is that the Israelites didn't get a day off. It was seven days of hard labor. Probably people didn't live all that long uh, because of um, the drudgery of their lives. And it just was miserable. And they so they cried out to God. And God said, I'm going to deliver you from this oppression. And I'm going to take you to a land, uh, the promised land, that it flows with milk and honey. In fact, it is described in Exodus 20, verses 6 and verse 15, as the most beautiful of all lands. Now, if you're a slave, and your life is drudgery every day, how'd that, how would that sound to you? That sounds pretty good. So, come on, God. Deliver us. We're ready. Right? Maybe. Maybe not. Turn to Numbers 13. You know what kind of blows me away? What's that? Not once in the world that we currently live in have I looked at pictures of Israel and thought, that is a beautiful land. I mean, it looks kind of sparse and Middle East, you know. Mm -hmm. But I guess compared to deserts, it's fantastic. <laughs> well, so two things. First of all, um, what it looked like then uh, may not be exactly what it looks like sure. now. But the other thing is there are very beautiful areas of Israel having been there. Um, beautiful, lush areas of Israel. And then there's the Dead Sea. And then there's the Dead Sea. <laughs> and the good neat thing about the Dead Sea is you can go out there and float in it. You know, it's uh, because of the salt content. So here, here's the promise, and you can imagine their excitement uh, about the promise. But something happens along the way, so let's read about it. Numbers chapter eight, uh, 13, 28 through 30. Somebody read that. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men had gone up with him and said, We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All these people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak, Anak um, come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. Okay, I should have probably had a start in verse 27, because that's, that's the report that 10 of the 12 spies gave. 10 of the 12 spies gave this report. So get this picture, all right? God has already taken them out of Egypt by this time uh, through the 10 plagues and brought them through the, the Red Sea and, and sustained them with, um, uh, with, with manna in the desert. There they stood on the brink of entering the Promised Land. Despite God delivering them from Egyptian captivity, it's fair to say the Israelites' relationship with God was rarely faith-filled. It wasn't unreasonable for Moses to send a reconnaissance mission of 12 spies for 40 days to know what was ahead. Not surprisingly, their report matched God's report. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. But it wasn't their job. Okay? 
it was not the job of the 12 spies to give their opinion about the feasibility <laughs> of taking the land. All their job was, was to go in, tell us what it's like, uh, maybe bring some products back to give us a taste of what it, literally a taste of what's there. And um, so we can be excited about it. What in their report reveals a faithlessness on their part? Why couldn't we do it? Got giants over there. Giants. We look like grasshoppers. What else reveals faithlessness? What? And I know God sent them, but why? Why did He send them? Why did He even have spies go and look at the land when He was just like, think, "Hey, I don't think this was God's idea." Well, did, I mean, God told Moses to send them in to okay. go spy in the land. Okay, the, the, the second time when they actually went in, uh, I think they they did uh, a similar thing. Oh, All sorry. right. Okay. So God sent them. It's just strange to me. I mean, if God says this is how it is, why do you need to send ten spies to go verify it? That, I don't know. Sorry, that's off topic. I apologize, but it, it just caught me <laughs> well, on guard. <laughs> but, but one of the things we do see uh, in God throughout Scripture is that He's 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 going to test people. What also, are you going to do with this? They also came back with clusters of grapes that they weren't carrying. Mm -hmm. So they were able to bring back and say, look, God promised you to do this. Yeah. Well, in verse 18, Moses did tell them, see what the land is like and whether the people who live in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many. So that comes back to why Moses needs to know that. <laughs> Well, yeah, if you go all the way back to verse 1, the Lord tells him to choose one from every tribe. And it's, I think, a lot of it is these are important people. Have them go see what the new land is so they can come back and tell their tribe it's all been worth it. Okay. So, so maybe God's intent was to build up enthusiasm, build up confidence going in. Show the fulfillment of what was promised. Show the fulfillment of what was promised. But then again, they were this afraid of a report. Maybe they're not ready to have an actual battle at this point. Maybe they need a few years in the desert because they don't even have enough faith to overcome a report. In, in fact, we will we will read or we will read today, but scripture says that God took them. The route that he did not directly into the promised land because they were not ready for battle. That they had not, uh, they were not battle tested and, and wouldn't, wouldn't have been able to do that. Dale, um, <clears throat> we've all heard my favorite statement you have to have skin in the game. <laughs> and I think what God is saying is, hey, I'm fighting with you, but you have a part to play in this. You, you've got to be prepared. And even in the physical preparation of this battle, you need to do your part. Okay. And so he was he was kind of nudging them to to, to put some skin in the in in, in the game, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe to like you're saying, maybe to build faith. Like if they just showed up and then all of a sudden saw these giant people, they probably would have turned tail and just ran, right? And then so maybe it's a, hey, I want to show you what you're getting into so you realize that you can't do this without me and that you need faith in me to do this. Yeah. And, and all of this is, is, is largely speculation, but it's consistent with the, with the character of God uh, as we know it, our speculation. But here's, here's the deal. Um, when, when they came back with uh, focused on all the obstacles, there are giants over there. There are fortified cities. Uh, the people are strong. They are too strong for us. 
<coughs> one of the lessons I think that comes out of this is the reason you want this, the reason you want people of faith setting a vision is so that you will accomplish what God wants you to accomplish. If you've got people who are setting the vision, who are like the, the 10 spies, you, you're going to accomplish nothing. I mean, Caleb jumps in and, and, and he's trying to, to rescue the whole mission. And he says, wait a minute. If God gave this to us, we can take it. What are we waiting for? It's a good land. And how far to get? Didn't convince many people, right? And so you have the Israelites who are coming in and have this kind of defeated mindset. God had already spoken. I'm going to give you this land. He did not need their input about whether or not to go. That's part of faith. Okay? That's part of faith. God had said, I'm giving you the land. Trust me and obey me. And the people said, it's impossible. So it kind of begs the question in our own lives, you know, when we face our impossibilities that God calls us to, will we trust him and obey him in those moments? Okay, because the temptation will always be to panic and to start looking around. What are other people doing that's making their life work? And that's not faith. All right, so let's keep reading. Numbers 14, 1 to 4, and then 7 to 9. Then all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. <clears throat> all the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness? Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become plunder. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? Uh, so they said to one another, let us appoint a leader and return to Egypt. And they, <coughs> they spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord. And do not fear the people of the land, for they will be our prey. Their protection has been removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Okay, so verses 1 through 4 is uh, the reaction of the people to the report of the ten spies. Verses 7 through 9 is Joshua and Caleb's um, exhortation to trust God. Now, Joshua and Caleb were passionate in their effort to persuade the pessimistic people to trust God and conquer the promised land. But fear had taken root in the hearts of the people. The spiritually immature people responded by grumbling. Put yourself in Moses' shoes for this man. What would you be feeling and thinking if you're Moses at this point? Why can't they remember how God delivered them? What had he done in the past? I mean, the, the power on, the, the greatest power probably on, on the earth at that time was the Egyptian army. What had God done to them? Historically, if you go back and look, today, it, Egypt is what, you know, I, I don't know who came up with these labels, but Egyptian is considered today a third world country. It happened right there. Okay? The, the prosperity, the, the power that Egypt had as uh, a world leader was changed. Okay? When the Israelites were delivered out of Egypt. What had God done? 
to the Egyptians. And so they, if you're Moses, you're, why can't they remember? What else are you thinking if you're or feeling if you're Moses? I'm a terrible leader. I'm a terrible leader. Why would you think that? Because I um, seems like Moses has the need to say it can't be done, and he's had to overcome that from the beginning to become who he was. <clears throat> so it's my fault. This is where spiritual leaders struggle, okay? You're in the moment where it's calling on, it's calling for faith, and you're not getting faith from the people who are supposed to be following. You're getting protests, you're getting whining, you're getting complaining, you're getting grumbling. You're not getting support. So give some examples of grumbling and how it impacts families, businesses, and churches. I'm not talking specifically about the story here. I want to move away from the story just to our practical lives. What are some examples of, of grumbling and how it impacts families, businesses, and churches? I think one of the differences is grumbling is not coming to the leader in a business and saying, okay, I've got an issue, we've got a concern, you know, this A, B, C, and D. You're in charge, but here's some things you should know. That's not grumbling. Grumbling you can't ever get a hold of because it's all it's in the corners, it's in the, you know, it's it's it, the word, it's not specific. It's just negative, but not <coughs> specific, nothing you can grab a hold of, nothing you can deal with. But if you look at the church, our world in the last year, especially when everybody, everybody's been so disconnected, you know, and grumbling is the rumor mill, for lack of a better comparison. You know, there's no truth coming in from any one direction. Everybody's got their own truth. And all we see is the damage on the backside, you know. Um, you know and whether you're talking about something really dramatic or something really small, you know, last week I came to service and found out that uh, Cohen had died. I had no idea. You know, I had no idea he was sick. You know, well, no one notified me. Well, why wouldn't they? You know, it's uh, little things and sometimes things you can't control that cause big trouble and somebody needs to be at home. Yeah, the, the, the natural reaction in Greek, one of the natural reactions is, is anger and blame. Sure. There's been a lot of research on this from an academic point of view. Um, negative effect and negative culture and how it impedes change and how it impedes um, working together as teamwork and actually you know, organizational performance as well as individual performances. So, kind of One of the things, if you're a sports fan, um, Samantha was talking about in the educational environment, but if you're a sports fan, you know that when new coaches are hired, what, what's one of the catchphrases they'd love to use now? I, what we need to do first and foremost is we need to change the culture. culture. What, what do they mean by that? From a positive to, to move to a more positive environment of thinking. Yeah. Change of thinking. Change of thinking from, from perhaps a, in a sports environment, from a, a context of uh, we're a bunch of losers, we can never win, to a, a positive, we're, we're, we, we're going to compete, we're going to win kind of mindset. Well, that's what we see here with the Israelites. We, we see a mindset of, um, of negativity. 
And in, a, in that kind of culture, they weren't going to be able to take the promised land. Well, there's no demand in that environment for accountability or solutions. Or it, it's easy to go, she has yes, lessons. Yeah. You know, that's easy. Yeah. It requires nothing, nothing. I think that's a cultural thing. It doesn't require anything. It's easy for me to do. I don't have to step forward and put myself out there. So it's just, yeah. Versus, I think, come up with a solution. You know, in this example, well, we're, we're just pretty big people. How are we going to be? You know, that's a whole different mindset. Yeah. And so that is not where the Israelites were as a whole. And so they came up. Uh, this is uh, we're going to read the Philippians passage. We're and, and then answer this question. They came up with this was their so these were their solutions in the next question. But let's read Philippians two fourteen through fifteen uh, before we talk about the solutions that Israelites came up with. Somebody read those two verses, please. Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may be blameless and spiritual in God, without blemish, so you live in crooked and perverse society in which you shine as lights. Would you read those first few words again? Do everything without grumbling or arguing, that you may be blameless and pure children of God, without blemish, that you live in crooked and perverse society in which you shine as lights in the world. Who's he talking to? He's talking about talking to followers of Jesus. And he wouldn't be saying those words unless what? <laughs> Unless there was some grumbling and complaining going on. Yeah. So stop grumbling and complaining. Um, the grumbling protest and mutiny of the Israelites was really a rebellion against God. What three features did their grumbling contain related to God? And, and this is uh, built in Numbers 14, 1 4. What, what is it that you see? Um, in their rebellion against God. I see a vision. Because they wanted to go back. All right. So so one of yeah, one of the things is they disregarded God's plan by wanting to go back to Egypt. God's plan was I want to do, I want to give you the promised land. I want you to go forward and as part of my judgment against the Canaanites. And I want you to take that land. Their idea was, I mean, can you imagine this? Let's go back to being slaves in Egypt. At least we had cucumbers and onions uh, and leeks to eat. We had all the fish we could, you know, we could desire. Let's go back to slavery. So one is they said, we, we don't trust your plan, God. We we want to go back. What else? It's the second thing. Second thing. Along with that, they didn't trust that he would protect them because they're like, What well, you brought us out here, we're just gonna be killed and five and children and plundered. All right, so they blamed God for what they saw as a hopeless, helpless circumstance. Our kids, our families, we're all gonna die out here. And it's your fault, God. Connor has a very unique psychology. One of the things that he has to do is basically keep a mood dictionary so that whenever he looks down and he's having a horrible day, he can look back and see not every day was horrible, but in that moment, you feel like it's always horrible. Very good. And that's where they were, wasn't it? Everything is horrible. Everything is horrible. Had forgotten completely, as Luke talked about, had forgotten completely about all that God had done for them while they were in Egypt. There's one other thing. What do you see? Well, I mean, dying in the wilderness. Who wants to start with that? Die in the wilderness. Is that what you look for? Well, that kind of goes along with what Misty said okay. about, about it's your fault. We're, we're here. We're all going to die here. They, they, how were they going to get back? We needed to choose a replacement. Sorry, Moses. That lousy, stinking Moses talked us into coming out here. We better find a 
Um, you know, Brad is right. It's 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 it, anybody in a leadership position immediately relates to this. Okay, whether you're a coach or you're a uh, executive or you are a preacher. Um, sometimes that's elder. You know, that's what you deal with. You deal with. You deal with people not living by faith and not trusting the leadership. And so we need to get rid of Moses. He's, he's a, God's our problem. Moses is our problem. Um, this promised land thing, that's our problem. No wonder Moses said, God, go ahead and kill me. Okay. I'm tired of leading these sorry people. You know, they, I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't bargain for this. I, I don't know what I did to deserve this. All right? So everything's kind of gloomy. Everything's kind of negative here. So here's how, this is question six, here's how Israel's actions toward God are described in Numbers 14. Listen to these words. Contempt. They have contempt for God. You know what Jesus said about contempt toward other human beings? Uh, he said that's the same as murdering. This is in the Sermon on the Mount. So that's effectively what they're saying is, you know, I wish God you were dead. Uh, they did not believe in him, verse 11. They put him to the test, verse 22. They didn't listen to his voice, 22. They were evil, 27, 35. They grumbled against him, 27, 29. They rejected the land, 31. They were unfaithful, 33. And they complained against him, 27. God was ready to destroy them. This is what, to me, makes Moses remarkable. <laughs> because there were times Moses was probably ready to destroy them, too. Uh, God was ready to destroy them, but Moses intervened and God relented. And though he pardoned them, they, were, they got to receive their grumbling plea. He brought us out here just to die in the wilderness. Well, that's not what he did. But guess what? That's what they got to experience because of their lack of faith. How does this affect how you handle those crises of faith in your own life when you're apt to grumble? All right, now we're making personal application. Ideally, what would you answer? Well, obviously, we, the word we've been using a lot is, is what we face all the time is that we forget. You know, so they were told to do their item six, you know, items in the forehead, and we're talking about them. They just forget. They're not having something constantly reminding, reminding them. You're going to show too, they're not fixing their eyes on Jesus. They're not, or on God in this case, you know, whatever. They're not, they have their eyes on the wrong thing, have their eyes on their obstacles. And, and so, I just think we need things around us as constant reminders. Either somebody or scripture in the right place, whether it be on our doorpost or whatever it is. And that's, there's a reason for that. Sometimes when I get up and uh, preach, I say, you already know this. You already know this. But we forget. And we need to hear it again. Yeah. Yeah. And 
And that would bless us in those moments of crisis if we would have people in our lives who would remind us of what we already know. Um, so that's one of the things that we can humbly do and, and ask God to increase our faith. I think we're too apt. This is just my uh, opinion about I think we are too quick to ask God to take away the obstacles. When our prayer should probably be, God, accomplish your purposes in me and through me. In these obstacles. Okay. Because I mean. Let's be honest. The giants and fortified cities. Those, those were real obstacles. Mighty warriors. Those were real obstacles. But. Rather than praying to take away the obstacles. Increase our faith. Be triumphant over the obstacles. Okay. Do we really believe. That nothing is too great for him. Do we really believe he is leading us? These are, these are the kind of faith questions that come in our own lives, not just the Israelites. So Psalm 95, 10 and 11, and then we will begin making this uh, full application to ourselves. Somebody read those two verses, please. Psalm 95, 10 and 11. reads this way, for 40 years I was angry, this is God speaking, 40 years I was angry with that generation, I'm speaking of the Israelites in the context we're, we're reading about, I said, they are a people whose hearts go astray and they have not known my ways, so I declared on oath in my anger they shall never enter my rest. Um, some translations uh, say that not that God was angry with that, but that he loathed that generation. He despised that generation. Anybody, anybody got that translation? Mine says he was disgusted. He was disgusted. So, God had some strong feelings toward this generation of the Israelites. Translation <laughs> says, angry, I despise, disgusted, or loathed that generation. What lessons stand out to you from this whole faithless episode? I, mean, I don't want to be known as the despised generation, the low. That's that's our eternal, that's our eternal um, label, the despised generation. That'd be awful, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. That's what these people were. So, what are the lessons for you standing out? Well, one way is what point I've gotten mad at you. <laughs> um, and I don't like people to be mad at me, particularly God, but, you know, lack of faith is the way that he takes a bit of danger. So, so show faith so that he won't be angry because the lack of faith shows we don't believe in him. We really don't believe him. It's we always forget that God can get through it. But God is out of love. He loved us. He forgave us. He forgave us. He forgave us. He forgave us. He certainly did. I think it's important mm -hmm. to note out with this generation, just like the angels, they didn't get any mercy when they rebelled. This generation we're talking about that left Egypt. If you read above it, it says, you, you saw these things and still did not. So look what they saw. <laughs> look what they witnessed before their own eyes. And so they were at a higher level of accountability, I believe, to God for their actions. And some of the things they saw, we, we talked about, is the plagues, God opening the Red Sea for them to walk through. On the they were, they, they experienced all of that. I mean, weren't, weren't they still being led by a cloud of fire every night? I mean, it's not like it wasn't happening anymore. <laughs> I mean, I guess you get used to the cloud of fire in the sky. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm serious. I mean, we're so 
Yeah. 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 Have the accountability, that higher level of accountability now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, because we know. We, we, like you said, we've got, we've got the word there, so we know. So, so, so kind of again, moving this along to, to its application to us, one of the things that I think would be helpful to us in our walks with Christ is in the moments when somebody is facing a crisis, what what if we often what are we often apt to do when somebody is facing a crisis? Join in their grumbling. Join in their grumbling. <laughs> yes. Why would God do this to you? I don't understand. And all of a sudden we're doing the same thing that the ten spies did. But what do we need to do in the midst of that? Instead of joining in the grumbling or uh you know, entering into a pity party of some kind. What, what do we need to do in those moments? Stop and pray. All right. Well, we would be way ahead of the game if we just stopped say, hey, let's not talk about this anymore yet. Let's stop and pray about it first, and then we can talk about it. What else can we do? Well, we default to trying to figure it out in our minds, right? To trying to work it out. And how's this going to, you know, how's this going to play out? What, what can I do? What should I should be doing that's smart and this this you know and this you know and that's what we default to instead of saying okay god what are you going to do what what do i need to rely on you for because we we start limiting what god can do right because we try to do it ourselves which is i mean it's stupid because we don't have control in the first place but well, that's what we do faith of a child that's all we need to have in fact jesus said you don't have if you don't become like one of these little children, you can't enter the kingdom of God. And part of what they're the amazing thing about a child is um, I rarely, I was going to say never, but I'd actually do remember one time. I rarely remember our children ever saying, Dad, are we going to have food when we get up in the morning? Dad, are we going to have a place to sleep? Tonight? <coughs> um, they trust. They trust. And so reminding, because we forget. We forget. Okay. We, we do. And, and Satan loves to fuel the, the doubts. And so reminding each other and entering into one another full of faith in the midst of the crisis will bless our lives. So, how would you rate God? Out of five stars. Seven. Seven. <laughs> Just like we would rate our coaches. <laughs> Seven. 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 All right. Well, uh, we are past time as usual. And, uh, but I, I wish you a blessed week and a faith-filled week.